Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. This year's budget was held the day after the 2024 election date was confirmed and amid difficult economic and fiscal conditions. Terence Grimmer joins me to discuss some of the highlights. Hi, Terence. Hello, Chanel. The big news of the day related to the new treatment of the gold and foreign exchange contingency reserve accounts. Yeah, that's correct. The GF craze, we've now come to know it as. Uh, it's been knocking around since before the mini budget, the medium term budget policy statement last year. Uh, it's an account that in the, sits in the Reserve Bank and it really accumulates the reserves. And when the currency depreciates, we make a profit, uh, a valuation profit in that account. And as we know, the, the RAND has been on a downward trajectory now. Uh, consistently, probably since the global financial crisis, but definitely since about 2011. And so in that process, we've got a massive positive valuation that's come into that account. Um, it's gone up to over 500 billion rand. And so there was a, a view amongst the number of economists that we should look at using this to provide some support during this, as you mentioned, this very, very difficult period that we're in. You know, we've got these rising borrowing, uh, borrowings, which are horrifically high when we look at the figures today. The growing uh, deficit, which was widened massively if you look at today's announcement. And, you know, these really surging borrowing costs that are now eclipsing other big budget items, such as health. So the view was that we should look at this. And there's been a conversation now for a number of months between the Reserve Bank and the national treasury and international experts. And there's a view that we actually outside of the international norms, our peer group actually do use these uh, these uh, positive valuations when they can. And it goes on to the national accounts. And that's what we are now. It's a very complicated system, but basically 250 billion is going to be made available of that 500 billion. 150 billion of that will actually go into helping us lowering our borrowings. So it will we'll have a lowering, lower borrowing trajectory going forward than we had when we announced the mini budget in, in November. It will also help obviously then reduce our, our borrowing costs about 30 billion over the period. And the other 100 billion is then retransferred back to the contingency reserve in the reserve bank that pays, it's the, the cost of using this. And it basically, sterilizes the, the liquidity that arises. So that, that's the sort of uh, cost. So it's a fairly sizable cost, but it is a reserve that we have accumulated over a number of years. The, the bill that was put in place in 2003 was put in very firm guardrails, which is why we haven't been uh, dipping into it because prior to that, we had a massive, um, we were on the other side of this account where we had massive losses. And we had to eventually fund those uh, and pay for those. So anyway, that that does change the outlook quite considerably uh, on the sort of the debt pile that we're going to be accumulating over the the interim the next three years, as well as massively on the debt servicing costs. So that it, it's a, was a debate as to whether it would feature at all in this budget. There was seeming resistance at one stage, uh, a concern that people were seeing this as a free lunch, but it now has been integrated. And I think the important news flow as well is that there's gonna be a framework agreement between the Treasury and the Reserve Bank about the future use of this fund or the, the management of this fund. And it has to be a cascading, they call it three buckets, but a cascading effect where the Reserve Bank solvency and, and the contingencies that it requires to put buffers in place to stabilize the RAND those are prioritized before anything can flow into the National Revenue Fund. There was less focus this year on the SOE's support for which overshadowed previous budgets. There's no doubt that the SOE's continue to be a major weight on this economy and all those um, uh, ratios that I mentioned earlier, the, the terrible deficit widening to 4.9% of uh, GDP uh, and all the bad growth outcomes that we're seeing at the moment, 0.6% growth in 2023 is what the new estimate is from the Treasury, which is a downward revision from the budget and a downward revision from the uh, the mini budget. 
Um, these are terrible, really, figures uh, or outcomes, given the context of South Africa's needs, high unemployment, as we saw with the employment figures coming out earlier this week. And, uh, you know, a, a cost of living crisis are, are in the economy where everyone is feeling the pressure. And also more and more companies not in a position to pay as much tax because of the, the more difficult uh, conditions, particularly, say, in the commodity space where our miners really bailed us out over the last couple of years on the revenue side. So everything is is very, very tight. And there's no doubt Eskom and Transnet are a major weight. And that weight has also come in the form of a fiscal burden, where we've seen a number of announcements around debt packages and guarantees. Now we had last year, the big story uh, was about Eskom getting $254 billion in debt relief. And there was a view that maybe Transnet would be in for something similar this year although there was pushback quite early from the, the finance minister on that and the treasury. And there hasn't really been any new news around uh, uh, support for state-owned companies other than what's in the system. In fact, there's been a bit of a tightening around certain uh, aspects. The fact that uh, Eskom hasn't met certain conditions around the sale of non-core assets, its finance company, means that it could lose some of the debt relief that has been set aside for it. And they've also tightened up on Danel, uh, the, the last 1.2 billion rand that has been ring fenced for Danel still there, but hasn't been transferred because they aren't meeting conditions. They haven't brought out financial statements for three years. And uh, on the Transnet side, you know, where there was a big focus uh, in December when the guarantee of 47 billion was announced, there, there too, there was no additional uh, resources and quite firm uh, conditions being set around non-core asset disposals, bringing in the private sector, opening up the network to third-party access, opening up the ports to private sector participation. So th those are the, that's really more the message that was coming through on the state-owned companies. No real new shock or horror around bailouts. There was some interesting news on the electricity and new energy vehicle fronts. Yes, because uh, load shedding is such a major feature of our lives in South Africa, you know, people are going to be looking at this budget to see what's said about Eskom, uh, said about the electricity environment in general. And on that score, there, there's, a, there's going to be a request for proposals as a pilot project to try and get private investment into grid infrastructure. Uh, that's going to be put out before the end of July. And that was an interesting tidbit of news coming on the energy front. There's also $2 billion or so set aside for smart meter rollout. Now, we've had some disasters there in the past, so we hope that this one will be better managed. So there's 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 a ticking over. And then, as I mentioned, sort of these tightening of conditions around the, the, the Eskom debt relief. And then also on the new energy vehicle front, uh, the, the industry has been waiting, one, for the policy, which we now have, in terms of the white paper um, and really the incentives that, that are going to overlay that to get the investment going into the production of, uh, of new types of vehicles, battery electric vehicles or hybrids in particular. And there we saw that there's this accelerated depreciation incentive that was announced for 150%. And the big question now is whether that's going to be sufficient in the context of many other economies looking to attract such in, such uh, OEMs to their shores, where that's going to be sufficient to really drive that investment. Uh, the, the Treasury did something of a search around peer markets like Morocco and Thailand, and they say we have a different framework and the accelerated depreciation has to be seen as additional to what's already in the system, already available to OEMs under the APDP and the associated plans within that. So it's it's additional. It's you know not it's not conditional. You could don't only have to have one and not the other. You can have both. But we'll have to see now how the industry responds because there's no doubt that the electric revolution's upon us. And we, you know, our automotive industries, yes, it's a domestic market, but most of the cars that we produce now are for export. And the internal combustion engine market is definitely going to start coming under some pressure. So if we're going to continue being a, a producer of cars, we have to start moving to these new platforms, these new uh, these new systems, 
battery electric vehicles, and I think also hybrids. Was this clearly an election budget, or did the minister hold to his previous fiscal consolidation position? Well, as you said in your intro, we heard that the 29th of May is the election date, and it was a difficult time to have <laughs> a budget speech because there are a lot of needs, and there's also a, a, there's revenue gaps. We knew there was we were entering this budget with at least a 15 billion gap on the revenue side. That was closed, but it wasn't closed through new taxes. So there was no a hike in the VAT or hike in personal in income tax or company tax. There was really, it was around bracket creep and using that uh, lever, which is very unpopular, but it's not as visible. And then obviously the normal sim taxes, even the fuel levy was held. I think there's a view that this is going to be another, uh, like electricity, this could be another constraint as we see uh, fuel prices rising strongly in the first couple of months of this year and the view that this con could continue. So to have added a fuel levy hike on that would have been quite punitive on the economy. So I think holding that line was important. So, we, but the fiscal balances, we do see the, the, uh, the, the stress on the debt side this rising debt, the debt repayments rising strongly, the widening of the deficits quite dramatically um, after a very traumatic 2023 with so many power cuts, which affected growth, very low growth. But on the whole, if you look over the, uh, with this, um, uh, the, the gold and foreign exchange reserve account coming into play, on the whole, we're seeing the line being held and actually somewhat being improved. So it can't be seen as a pure election budget, but would this have come through as quickly and as urgently um, uh, as, as it has is, is something that we could debate. But it has come through. It doesn't seem to be out, uh, out of the norm of what other countries do with these sort of uh, these reserve valuations and sort of um, making benefits or making hay from them. So it doesn't seem totally out of kilter. But it has that we have from a treasury perspective, they have moved pretty quickly on that front, and that has made the budget look, uh, I think, a lot better than it would have been. But we're still in a difficult situation. Uh, we still have load shedding with us as a threat. We still have the logistics crisis as a threat, and you know, if when we're not growing by more than one percent a year, and as we saw with the terrible growth performance of 2023, and the outlook. You know, they're giving a fairly better outlook, but it's still maxing out at about 1.8% growth uh, over the three-year period, averaging 1.6. Many are seeing that even as optimistic. You know, without growth, uh, a lot of these things are going to remain very big impediments. So, no, I don't think it's purely an, invest, uh, an election budget, but it definitely has elements that look better than they could have looked if they hadn't made some urgent decisions. Thank you. That's the second take show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.